Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of October 17th, 2013. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight. Um, we start with public comment, and, and, and the meeting doesn't actually convene until 7.05 if there is absence of public comment. We have no one signed up. Is anyone interested in speaking before the council tonight? Well, <laughs> then we will go into recess, I'm sorry, until uh, 7.05. I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Here. Present. Here. Yeah, here. Present. Here. 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 I see it as a We'll start with communications from the mayor. The mayor doesn't have any communications. It's well, that comes up next. Now, <laughs> no communications from the mayor, but we do have proclamations, and the mayor has a proclamation ready to present. Looks like he wants to communicate. Well, he's yes, communicating uh, a proclamation, so we're blending two. Either, either one works, I guess. So, uh, good evening, counselors. Uh, this is actually a, um, a proclamation uh, that um, did not, was not prepared in time to be on your agenda, um, but it's very timely for this weekend, so I wanted the opportunity to be able to to present it tonight. Um, it's entitled Pioneer Valley Symphony Day, October 19, 2013. Uh, whereas the Pioneer Valley Symphony, one of the oldest community orchestras in the nation, is a resident company of the Academy of Music, and whereas the Pioneer Valley Symphony Orchestra and Chorus has long served the residents of Northampton by offering symphonic and choral performances, providing local residents the opportunity to participate in music making, and whereas the Pioneer Valley Symphony will begin its 75th season on October 19th at the Academy of Music with Jubilation, featuring renowned pianist Jeffrey Burleson, and whereas in honor of its 75th anniversary, the Pioneer Valley Symphony has inaugurated a youth orchestra, which will perform its spring concert at Northampton High School during this season. Now, therefore, I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim Saturday, October 19th, as Pioneer Valley Symphony Day in the city of Northampton and duly urge that Northampton residents attend and otherwise support Jubilee and other performances of the Pioneer Valley Symphony Orchestra and Chorus. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and affixed the seal of the city of Northampton, David J. Narkowitz, Mayor. Um, so, and we actually have a, a, a member of the Pioneer Valley Symphony amongst you, uh, Councillor Carney, and actually I, I'm unable to attend uh, the event um, this weekend, so Councillor Carney is going to actually uh, read the proclamation, I hope, the night of the event. Um, so, and I think that you've got some flyers about the actual concert this weekend. Um, Mayor, I just ask uh, our executive director is here to accept oh, excellent. the proclamation. Excellent. Hi. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. I'll give Thank you the you proclamation so much. and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Suzanne Dunlap. I'm very new to a very old organization. This is my first season, and they're 75th. And I just wanted to thank the mayor for issuing this proclamation and recognizing the contribution that Pioneer Valley Symphony makes to this region as a cultural treasure that's been around a long time. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you for your part in this asset. We and appreciate it. May I, Mr. President, thank you, Mayor, for the proclamation, and Suzanne, and I will also want to thank uh, Councillor Adams, who has uh, agreed to actually read the proclamation, as I will be seated in the second violin section and will be uh, more indisposed to get up and read. So I'm thanking in advance Councillor Adams for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, I believe there are no more proclamations, so uh, we'll move on to the next item of business, which is an announcement of public hearings. On Thursday, November 7th, uh, 2013, at 7.05 p.m., this is regarding Sandry Realty Incorporation, Incorporate, Incor, Incor, Inc., uh, doing business as Sunoco at 776 North King Street, Northampton, Massachusetts, an application for a license amendment for storage of fuel, and also an announcement of the, a tax classification hearing at 7.10 p.m. on Thursday, November 7th, 2013. And next up. Where, where's that hearing? That's, he, that's here, right, in council chambers, yeah. Well, we will be sitting. 
Um, and now it's time for one minute announcements. Any councilors have any one minute announcements? I know Councilor Carney does, even though she's not looking up. I'm so, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Um, thank you for reminding me. Uh, we had a great event the week before last, I believe, on Saturday, and it was the Dollars for Scholars scavenger hunt. Um, I uh, was very uh, grateful to have a team of Councilor Marion Labarge, Councilor Adams, and Councilor Dwight, without whom I would not have been able to um, announce that we placed uh, second place. <laughs> and um, were among many other teams that spent the day, a good part of the morning, hunting down items of uh, historical lore in the city of Northampton and also challenged to do many other uh, academic exercises that included mathematics and geography and other forms of uh, social sciences. So it really uh, required us to put on our thinking caps and to walk uh, probably about five miles since we had a few <laughs> ups and downs. Um, <coughs> So, and, the, and for such a great cause, the Dollars for Scholars um, event raised, I don't have the figure, but it was a significant amount of money, also from local area businesses to uh, provide scholarships for Northampton students, not only from Northampton High and Smith Vocational, but also Northampton students that may be attending uh, high school elsewhere. So it was a great event. I wanted to publicly thank everybody who participated and, um, I'll ask if my colleagues have any others to say, but I'm simply great. glad that we acquitted ourselves. That we went in with absolute dread that we would come dead last, <laughs> which would be really mortifying. How many which teams were there? Mm -hmm. Two. Two. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we, we, <laughs> oh, no, there were many other teams. We, we, and we came close. Actually, we came close. Yes. Surprisingly close, and with just one little error of reading. I will two. point out that we were stumped by, w we were supposed to be standing north looking south to Paradise. We assumed it was Paradise Pond and for the longest time we're up uh, north, north of Paradise Pond <laughs> trying to find our, our location when in fact the location of Paradise was Paradise Copies. So oh, Tricky. We were stumped there. Yeah. So. Tricky. 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 Dirty. Otherwise we would have owned that. We would have won. <laughs> Sure, thank you. This is short one, one minute announcement. I, I don't know if the public's been aware of this, but heretofore there's been three bachelors on the Northampton City Council. <laughs> but I understand our number has now been reduced by one. Councillor Adams has well, not quite had his proposal accepted. <laughs> so congratulations to Councillor Adams. <laughs> Thanks. Um, He's still a bachelor. <laughs> not for long. <laughs> it's Two years. <laughs> uh, any other one minute announcements? Yeah, okay. Very fun announcements. I want them to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> some more. It's all, it's all, yeah. it's all rainbows and unicorns yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Early. Now, now to kill the unicorns. <laughs> okay. Is here to make a presentation. <laughs> here enough, I, am, I am actually not going to kill unicorns. Tonight. Okay. I'm so impressed about how quickly this is moving. There must be a baseball game on tonight or something. <laughs> um, I know we know nothing eight about that. <laughs> First pitch, eight oh five. Just for eight for all. Don't worry, I will. I'm from New Jersey. You guys know I can talk fast. Um, so I'm Marisa Hebel, and I'm the coordinator of the Northampton Prevention Coalition. Karen Jarvis Vance, program director for the Northampton Prevention Coalition. So we are actually here tonight to tell you about our new youth substance use data. And um, Mary, you can actually advance to the next slide. We are actually going to flip the script on the way we usually present this data, even the way we did at the school committee last month. Um, we usually, in the public health field, focus a lot on what we should all be very worried about and what we should all be very concerned about and want to leave you with fear. <laughs> um, and what's true is that there's a lot going really well in Northampton for young people. Um, and tonight I actually want to flip the script a little bit and have more of a balance between all the things that are going really well and what young people in Northampton are already doing really well. Um, and then there's some things we need to be concerned about and things we still need to work on, but I just want to make sure and strike that balance. I don't want to carry on any misperception that young people in Northampton are not doing a lot really well. So it's going to be a little bit of sunshine. You can go ahead. And rainbows. And, and rainbows, right. Excellent. 
Um, and this is just to say that there's a lot um, that this community has for young people. There's a lot really well, going really well. We can skip. I've talked about this a bunch here before. Um, we know the teen brain is not finished developing until about 25. And you know, really why we're investing so much in, in, um, in substance use for young people is because we want to give them the best start. We want them to have the best start possible for a long and healthy future. I can get everyone a copy of this if you want to focus on it more. So every two years, we survey the students in Northampton. And students countywide are surveyed. Um, this is students in eighth grade, 10th grade, and 12th grade. And that's what I'm going to show you some of tonight. Um, and you can go ahead. So this is our 30-day substance use data. This is all the substances that we ask young people about on the survey. Uh, this is helpful for us to see our, to our primary substances that we're looking to reduce in Northampton are alcohol and marijuana. Um, and this tells us that we're, we're in the right place. Uh, those are the top two substances of choice amongst young people. 30 day is the measure that we use because 30 day in the public health field is an indicator of regular use. That's the best indicator of regular use. You can also jump in and ask questions at any point. At any point in the last 30 days. Uh, I, I can't help noting the, the absence of meth methamphetamine use in that the, it is at plate proportions in a lot of other places in the country. And I, obviously the Northeast isn't as well established, but the, the fact that there's absolutely no evidence of it's encouraging. Yeah, absolutely. And this is also to say, so these are our students who are in school. Um, I, you know, I think that there's, there's, there may be differences among students that we don't, young people who are not in school that we don't mm -hmm. capture. Um, but it's important to see, but most of our students that are in Northampton are in school and it, yeah, methamphetamines are not an issue. One other uh, thing to note on this graph, the inhalants shows a higher use among eighth graders mm -hmm. than the 10th or 12th. I'm assuming that's asthma medication maybe? That's, no, it's actually things like glue and things like that oh. that are huffed. And those tend to be more popular among younger kids because they're more readily available than alcohol, tobacco, cigarettes, um, marijuana. Ready, Ready whip. whip. Straight up. Again. So this is the first example of balancing hope and concern. So it's hard to see, but the purple on the bottom are students who, have, who indicate that they've drank in the last month. And the blue on the top are the students who have not drank in the last month. And in fact, it is the norm in Northampton, if you are a teenager, to not drink. Um, I'm just going to do a quick aside right now on a little bit of social science. So we know that perception of what other people are doing has a strong influence on our behavior. This is true for everyone because we're social beings. <laughs> it is particularly true in adolescence. What we think people are doing and what we think the majority of our peers do and think has an influence on our behavior. But very often we misperceive what people around us are doing. We tend to overestimate the unhealthy behaviors of our peers and underestimate the healthy behaviors of our peers. Um, and it is very true in adolescence. One thing we can all do is correct those misperceptions. So the misperceptions that all teens in Northampton are, are drinking is inaccurate. So we can all do that. We can correct those misperceptions in the community and in our interactions with young people because that's influential on their behavior. So it's the norm in Northampton if you're a young person. I'll just say it again. I want this to be the take home message. If you're a teenager in Northampton, it's the norm for you not to drink. Do we have concerns that half of, that half of our senior class reports drinking in the last month? Absolutely, we're working on that. But it is still the norm not to drink if you're a teenager in this community. I have a question about the reliability of the data. Uh, yes. so, so how do you measure the non-reporting aspect of this, for even though I know they're assured that it's confidential, but I, I can only assume there's some percentage of teens that just can't bring themselves to tell the truth. So yeah. I'm just curious how that statistically is That's factored. That's a great in. question. I'd say it's our most common question. Yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah, is how reliable are, are the survey yeah. results? So we have, there are, there's a number of things. So we have, there are, the way that the survey is administered is really important. So it is anonymous, it's voluntary, mm -hmm. and it's confidential. Uh, those three characteristics are the characteristics we know that people feel the most comfortable being honest on, on their, in their responses. And that's the way the survey is administered. Not only is the entire sur participation in the entire survey voluntary, but participation in any one question is voluntary, so a student can opt out. Then there are a few, the, the last question on the survey is, um, 
how honest were you on the survey? And apparently research shows that the way that people respond to that survey is the way that, the, that question is the way that they actually were on the survey. So if someone says that they were not honest on the survey, that survey is not counted. There's also catches for inconsistencies on the survey. So if someone says they never drank, and on another question they said they drank every day, or that they drank and drove, but they answer, if there's an inconsistency, those surveys are not counted. There's also a false drug on the survey. So if someone is going through and saying yes, 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 that student, that survey is also not counted. This is not account for the outliers. The outliers, by and large, someone who really can't tell the truth or someone who's way over reporting their use for whatever reason. But outliers don't tend to skew the majority. Those really tend to be outliers. And what is the total number of surveys? 476. So it's about 76% of our population. Which for a census survey is actually pretty good. Considering actually Northampton is pretty tough to survey because our seniors have, amongst all schools because of the structure of the setup. It's a very di unique setup um, with a block schedule and with the amount of very good freedom that our seniors have to do internships and teaching assistantships and those kinds of things. It's just hard to get all the seniors in one place at one time. So, so the next what, slide. Um, most of our students are also not binge drinking, and I should have mentioned this on the other side. We're looking at 8th, 10th, 12th, and the far right is all Northampton teens. This is important for us to know because students who are, for a woman drinking four or more drinks in one evening or an event, and uh, men drinking five or more, that tends to be the place where people t tend to start having negative consequences related to their drinking. So these students are the students who are having negatives related to their drinking, and we want this number to continue going down. So. Um, it's also the norm in this community that teens are not over drinking. So we asked teens where they're getting alcohol from. This is the common, this is common um, in all of Hampshire County that social sources are the top, um, the top sources of alcohol. I would just like to say that it is, young people are not by purchasing alcohol from our retailers. Our retailers in this community are doing a really good job. Um, with not allowing young people with checking fake IDs and catching fake IDs and not allowing young people to buy from um, from our establishments, so that's great. On the next slide, I'm actually just going to break this one down a little bit. Um, oops, there's a little bit of animation problem there. So this is students who say that they got alcohol at home, did and did not get alcohol at home from their parents. Um, most parents in Northampton are not providing alcohol to their teens. And this is where we ask students where they're drinking. So we also focus group students this last, um, this last spring, and we do one-on-one -on -one interviews often. And those, uh, those other sources of data corroborated this, that the, the, that the primary place the students are drinking is at unsupervised parties. And that's actually one of our initiatives this year, is looking at preventing unsupervised underage drinking parties. This is just another way to break out that last slide, particularly with this, is that um, these are students who said they did or did not drink at someone else's home with that teen's parents' permissions. permission. Most parents are not allowing teen drinking in their house. Um, yes, there's 30%, a little bit more than 30% of senior parents who are allowing drinking in their house, but by and large, the vast majority of Northampton parents are not allowing teens to drink at home. Um, this is drinking and driving in the last month. So this is new this year. We actually have never asked this. We hear a lot, like, we did it. We all turned out fine. What's the big deal? Um, nothing's, you know, they're not having any downsides from drinking. So we actually added this question. We wanted to know what negative consequences. We know the harm to the, the developing brain, but we wanted to know in the here and now what negatives um, students are having related to their drinking. Um, and this is what they told us. I tend to think that problems at school or work is a little underreported. I'll just say that. So I think that not all young people might be connecting, getting sick on Saturday night, hungover on Sunday, with the inability to maybe completely prepare for school on Monday. <coughs> so that's just my opinion, but I tend to think that might be a little underreported. Well, I was going to say, too, that we know that the uh, effect of alcohol lasts long after the hangover has passed. So your cognitive ability and your uh, ability to have good attention and focus um, is impaired for several days after an alcohol drinking incident. So even though they may feel physically completely recovered, their actual ability to perform in school is still impaired. Um, so this is our 30-day marijuana use. Um, again, uh, if you are a teenager in Northampton, it is the norm that you are not using marijuana. 
and we asked young people where they're getting uh, marijuana from. Um, again, social sources. Top. So we also asked young people, what are the negatives that you're experiencing related to your marijuana use? Uh, and this is how they responded. Um, I will say again here, I think doing poorly on a test or at school is a little underreported. Um, the top, uh, let's see, in the top four, so feeling unmotivated, uh, difficulty remembering things, procrastinating, I think those are behaviors that are related to academics. So I would again say that um, not doing well on a test is, or, might, or not doing well in school is probably a little underreported here. Also, Dave, could, we, could you back up one slide yeah. to where they're getting? <clears throat> and from someone on school property, do you think that's high? Do you know, I actually, do, I don't know, I can look at how that, that compares to the rest of the county. Yeah. Um, I don't, I think that we're unique in Hampshire County. I don't think we're at, this is a nationwide question, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious. I just didn't know if you, had it, if you knew. I know that that's, that's probably common in, um, across Hampshire County, but I can find okay, out. Okay, thank you. And, and as far as the, maybe crafting the question next time, as far, I think you're right trying to associate your school performance with something that you did days before there's not you're you're not capable of personally we're, none of us are capable of personally assessing what impact right. that would have on I school would, I would agree with that. but this is important for us to be able to talk to students about their motivation to maybe cut back or quit uh, and to help them link the fact that feeling tired unmotivated difficulty remembering things might actually, even though they may not figure that out on a survey, because we have that data and we know there's a disconnect there, it helps us to better have a conversation with kids later on about that. We weren't actually sure how students were going to respond to this, so mm -hmm. we were actually, um, this was interesting to us to see mm -hmm. how many negatives they were relating to their marijuana use. Um, so interestingly enough, more young people, by far it's the norm not to drive after using marijuana in this community, but more young people are driving after using marijuana than are driving after drinking. Um, so this is something that we're certainly gonna be looking at and working on in the next coming years. By far, our young people are not using prescriptions without um, a prescription. We have seen a slight uptick amongst our seniors in using stimulant medications to study um, but even that said, nine out of 10 of our seniors are not using any stimulant medication to study, but we have seen a slight rise, and that also goes along with um, uh, an increase that we've seen in college. Um, and what young people are telling us is that has to do with um, studying and preparing for tests, particularly bigger tests. Um, but that said, by and large, our teens in Northampton across the board are not using prescription drugs without a prescription, Aren't which is great, because this is something we're really paying attention to, because we, we know that this is an issue in other communities, even in Massachusetts. The, I mean, the use of Adderall, for instance, a prescription to, for a child with an attention deficit disorder who may have prescription for Adderall makes it even more accessible to the students, and it's fairly common throughout the country, of, of students exchanging their prescriptive drugs that are actually stimulants. Yeah, and you know, we didn't, I didn't include that slide here but on here, but we asked students where they're getting prescriptions from, if they're taking a prescription without a prescription, and from a friend is the very, by far, the top, the top way of knowing. And then we, when we focus group students, we ask them that too. Um, and it's knowing someone who has a prescription that they asked for one or they buy one from them. And so doing more conversations with parents about talking more to their young people about the dangers of sharing um, medication. Yeah, by, by, I mean, the, the point being, of course, they're not necessarily buying this on the street. They're buying it uh, because there may be some assumptions. If it's prescribed to you, it's safe. And Absolutely. that it's and, and it's very, very specific purpose. Right. It's, it mm -hmm. seems to be the stimulant use. It seems very specific. It's really test, test and school preparation. Because. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It strikes me as low. It's just, it, I mean, it, if that's, those are the numbers. Those are the numbers. But to me, that seems like one of the, the easiest ways to get drugs is by other people's prescriptions, um, family members, friends, et cetera, and not just amphetamines, you know, opiates it's, and, uh, and painkillers. So that, that number just strikes me as, as kind of low. Um, but I guess that's the data. That's good. Maybe we that's don't great. have enough that's big great. tests in our Northampton system. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> 
Well, you know, to be honest with you, the survey's really, the survey really breaks it down. It breaks it out and asks, you know, it, it gives examples of the names. Um, so we're confident in this, but we are paying attention because it is a growing trend, um, and really even in other communities. So we, we're definitely paying careful attention to the prescription issues. This was our fourth data point over eight years. So we just want to show you guys some changes that are being made. We're seeing some really nice decreases with our eighth grade and, and 10th grade, um, and, and we're, we're paying attention to the fact that our seniors are, are plateauing. This is making us think that we need to be doing some more age-specific um, prevention. It, prevention really, I mean, I my son just graduated from high school. I, I know prevention looks much different when they're 12 than when they're 18. And so, uh, yeah, Karen can attest to that. <laughs> this is a great number to see going down. Yeah. Uh, we're very happy about this. This means that, uh, especially particularly amongst our eighth and tenth grade, where it is really going down. Um, yeah, these are this is the less students that are having negative consequences related to drinking, the better. Marijuana use. I'll be frank. We've expected it to be a little bit all over the map in recent years. This has been such a changing climate in Massachusetts. Um, so frankly, we expected a little bit more of an uptick. In 2008 is when decriminalization happened, and 2009, spring of 2009 is when we surveyed and we did see an uptick. But we expected, we anticipated more of an uptick in 2013, and we were happy to not to see. Uh, a little bit with our sophomores, but not with our senior class. Uh, and so we're just continuing to get the message out there that we don't want young people to use, that there is, we want these two messages to be able to coexist, that we want marijuana as medicine for people who it's supposed to be for, um, and that youth prevention can exist at the same time as that. That we, we, want, we want to empower the community to be able to say marijuana is spe specific for people with certain illnesses and that we don't want our young people to use. Do we know about the trend for the rest of the state in, in, in this um, comparatively here? Because I think that's important because I remember when, when the, the, around the time when the discussion was had, when the law was going to be voted on, one of the concerns was that use would go up amongst teenagers, and, mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't seem to be happening here in Northampton, at least with two out of the three age groups. Yeah. Um, I actually think that most, for the most part, marijuana use is on the rise yeah. amongst young people. Um, I do know for sure that the perception of harm related to marijuana use for young people is on the decline. And the social science research says that when kids think that something is less harmful, they're more likely to do it. So things are changing so quickly, and we survey every two years that it, we're, it'll be really interesting to see what's happening. But, but we really do want the community to be empowered to be able to have both of those two messages coexist and not be independent of each other or at odds, for sure. Um, I'm sure they're taking into consideration as we make marijuana less and less of an offense mm. legally. You mean young people? And then all of a sudden start providing manufacturing facilities for using it for medication. I think so. In our they're going to start to think that, well, this stuff might not be so bad. Well, in our, mm -hmm. That's interesting you say that. In our focus groups in the spring, some students actually thought that it was already, that marijuana was legal. Um, and so there was a little bit of confusion around that. And then, um, some students, and I don't want to give a misperception that this is all Northampton students, this is one student who said that um, Mar he felt that marijuana is already easy to get, that the dispensaries would make it um, easier to get more of a variety of, of marijuana. So it's, it's interesting what students are taking in, and I think it's why it's really important for us to be really clear um, as a community and, and, enable, and empower our parents to say both of those things to young people, that marijuana is medicine for a specific reason, and, but we still don't want our young people to use. So we looked a little bit deeper into our, into our data, and this is just showing, we wanted to know if there was a relationship between students who are drinking and students who are using marijuana. So we're looking at students who did and did not drink in the last month and whether or not they used marijuana. So on the left, we've got, among students who did not drink in the last month, about 5% also used marijuana. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. among students who did not drink in the last month, 5% in fact used marijuana. We're looking at students who drank in the past month on the right, and among them, 55% had also used marijuana in the last month. Mary, you can skip ahead. And we looked at it in the, in the other way as well. So most <coughs> students who used marijuana or did not in the last month. Um, students who did not use marijuana, about 18% had also drank in the last month. And then among students who did, um, more than 80% um, had also drank in the last month. So that's actually helpful for us to know also because um, our, our prevention efforts are looking at both of those. So we know that if we're going to be working on one, the other, or both, we're going to be affecting both, if that makes sense.
we uh, always do these kind of cross comparisons. So we, this is just showing us that kids who have parents who let them know that they think it's wrong for them to drink, that that impacts their drinking. So this is showing us that kids whose parents who say that their parents think it's wrong for them to drink are less likely to drink than if they're, they think their parents do not think it's wrong for them to drink. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> the same is true for marijuana. Kids whose parents say that it, who believe that their parents believe it's wrong for them to use marijuana are much less likely to have used marijuana in the last month. Same with knowing where your teenager is when they're not at home and who they're with. Um, our teens are less likely to drink when their parents know where they are uh, and who they're with. And one of our big pushes in the last in these last few years mm -hmm. has been directed at parents. Parents connecting with other parents, parents communicating their policies and expectations to their kids. Um, Talking to other parents, having those awkward, uncomfortable conversations that we all have to have with our teenagers and with other parents, you know, um, we're always encouraging parents to have those awkward conversations. <laughs> and we know how hard it is. You can go to the next one. So this is just a little small glimpse into what we're, what we're working on for the next year. For both substances, we're actually looking at, um, we're paying attention to Avail availability, parent attitudes favorable to alcohol use, and youth attitudes favorable to alcohol use. Like I said, unsupervised parties are one of our big um, priorities because that is where the majority of drinking is happening. Um, we're going to be doing some educating young people and adults around social host liability. Um, we're not sure, and we hear that not everybody actually understands the social host law, mm -hmm. and we think that that's important for even young people to understand. Um, we are always encouraging parents around family policies and, and knowing where your teens are. Um, and I think the rest is pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. There's a lot of things going on under each of these. And yesterday at the DA's uh, underage drinking prevention conference, we had a speaker who talked to the kids about the effect of alcohol and drugs on the developing brain. Talked a lot about the brain science, showed a lot of imaging. She was really engaging, really interesting. And the message that I heard from the kids who I was working with, and I've also heard through our screening program we're now doing in the ninth grade, is a lot of them were not aware of the effect of alcohol and drugs on the developing brain. They weren't aware of all the the changes that can happen, the risk for addiction, so on and so forth. So I think this is really what, where you see perception of harm. We have a lot of work to do with kids around the science. They really like the science behind it. They, they really get into that. And we can, I think, do a lot of good around that. I just also want to mention that thanks to the efforts of our um, Director of Health and Safety, um, all ninth graders at Northampton High School have now had a screen related to substance use. And this is, the, this, is this last year. We just started this program. Um, and a screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. And we are one of very few high schools in the state and in the country that are, doing, that are using this type of evidence-based screening tool. Um, most students go through high school not having an, a, a direct conversation with a trusted adult about substance use. And um, last year, all of our ninth graders did. The nurse is, um, is doing a, a sub added a substance use screening to her um, to her tip her regular screenings, and that is really uh, by and large we supported it, but it's by and large the efforts of, of Karen getting that to Northampton High School. So, and that will continue. And we'll probably move. It'll look a little different because the screening tool is a little different, but we'll move into the eighth grade, probably not this year, but next year. These are just a few little snapshots about how you can collaborate with us and we can make prevention efforts last. One thing that we really know is that when uh, eventually our grant funding will end. And so the way that we can make it so that the prevention work keeps going once our grant funding is ending is if our work is absorbed into the community. So whenever you, in whatever way that you, you know of or can think of and that, you, that our work can be integrated um, with the work that you are doing or work that you know is going on, we want to take advantage of all of those opportunities so that this keeps going when our fund, when we are not here anymore. Um, and so that's just a little plug to have us Thanks. keep working with you. <laughs> uh, so we are now, we are just entering our fourth, we just entered our fourth year. Um, we are funded for five years. We will apply for another five years. So next year we'll apply for another five years. It's very competitive. I believe we are a terrific candidate. We're doing great work. We hear we're a terrific candidate, but this is federally funded. And so you never know. You really are not sure. It's provided the federal government is actually functioning Open. at any given moment. <laughs> so, okay. 
I will also just say that we have a coalition meeting on um, October 29th where we're going to be working on exactly what we're doing um, for the coming year, and everyone is obviously invited to that. Yep. So as, as the Northampton City Council, what can the City Council do to help you possibly get funded? Is there anything that we can do? Um, that's a great question. Get involved in our efforts, and the more that we can show that we're working on things such as policies and ordinances and things that will last for a long time, the more likely we are to be funded for another five years. The more people we have at the table and involved in the work, the more likely we will be to be funded. It's, Thank you. This isn't going to be the case that you don't have where you're going to prove that you... Well, there's so many factors influencing yeah. substance use, I think we'll... It's okay. definitely so it's still something to work on. The key things that they really look for are A, that you are having an effect, so your successes actually do work in your favor, but B, that you have a plan in place to be sustainable right. for the work to continue beyond the funding. Well, we'll certainly have to consult as to what, what type of initiatives would come from this council that might continue to promote your uh, program. Absolutely. Councilor Adams. You, up there it said ordinances. Uh, do you have any examples of that from other communities? What, what sort of ordinances other communities have enacted? Oh, uh, we've heard of lots, and I could certainly see, seek that for you. I mean, we've heard of, um, oh, geez, uh, teen, teen, we've heard teen party ordinances. Uh, in Amherst, they've done um, various, uh, uh, and you know, ones that would not necessarily apply here, but other things that have had an impact in other communities. In Amherst, this was a bigger issue, but um, nuisance house bylaws and things like that. So, so any ordinance that comes across, or that if there's a way that you can reflect on how this impacts youth in Northampton, which I know that you already do at every turn. Um, uh, but you know, really, anything that, um, that access, availability, and advertising are the community factors that influence youth use. So when there is something that relates in any way to that, um, that's really uh, a terrain that we can help you with. Um, and there, we have access to lots of um, uh, model ordinances that have taken, you know, that have been put in place across the state, and um, we can certainly get those. Yeah, I, I'd be interested to see some. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I hope it was a little bit of rainbows and unicorns. Oh, no, that was yeah, wonderful, a actually. That, I, I have to say that I, I am very encouraged by your good work and, and your, actually your approach. Good. Your approach is, is refreshing <laughs> and I think consequently very effective. And good. so, so. Um, we don't want to be the bearers of doom and gloom. When no, no. <laughs> well, it's, it's not just that. <laughs> it's, it actually, it's, it's dealing with substance abuse and people. <laughs> as substances and as people. And that's actually kind of important. Um, to date, previous um, you know, anti-drug initiatives and behavior and policies and programs have really created this kind of distinct us versus them type of scenario, which actually allows a lot of people to more or less forgive themselves or including kids and adults from actually understanding their part in this. And, and I'd like to say that you guys have done a really great job of, of approaching this holistically mm. with, with an understanding that this is a community issue and it's, it's community sponsored. It's not, there aren't evil men in trench coats that are bent on trying to destroy our lives. This is us hurting us. And I think that's a great approach. It makes a lot of sense, and it's it's less draconian and silly than some yeah, of the other programs. I totally agree. And you know, you bring up a really good point, and that's something we don't even even for the parents. We do a lot of parent-focused work, and we even our parents who who think that their kids have already drank or think that their kids are using marijuana already. We want those parents in our in our coalition mm -hmm. as well. There's still good things that the, that our parents. We don't want parents to think we only want the parents to work with us whose kids have always done everything right and you've always been perfect because we know that's not real life. So there's still something all of our our parents can be doing mm -hmm. sixth grade, fifth grade, fourth grade, up to twelfth grade and beyond. So, good point. Uh, Council of the Barge. I want to thank the both of you again. I think the presentation was excellent. I think it's really good that you come in like this and educate the public, and we keep the communication going. Mm -hmm. So, this was excellent, and thank you. Thank you, you for letting us come on the agenda. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, up next is approval of minutes. We have uh, minutes for transportation, parking, committee on economic development, housing, and land use. Uh, the minutes from public safety. Move uh, approval as a group. There we go. Second. Second. 
Motion's been made to approve them as a group. All those in favor, please aye. say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, yes, all right. And then now a uh, motion to approve the last minutes from the last meeting. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion on those? All those in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain. An Me abstention too. from uh, Councilor Owen Freeman Daniels. No, I uh, Now we. We are going to recess for the Finance Committee meeting. I'm passing the gavel figuratively, of course, to Councilor Murphy, who is the chair. So, Mary, would you call the roll of finance? Councilor Murphy? Here. Councilor Here. Councilor Present? Here. So we have one item on finance tonight, and this... I got it. Now I got two. <clears throat> and this is the return to something we dealt with back in June, and this is the glycol. Remember the glycol in the heating system at the high school? Well, the, the actual bid to do the work came in higher, so I'll read it for you. Whereas the City Council appropriated on June 27, 2013, $59,000 from the undesignated fund balance for the Northampton High School heating cooling system freeze protection as part of the FY14 capital plan, whereas the low bid for the project was $87,765, leaving a shortfall of $28,765, and whereas the Northampton Public School maintenance budget will contribute half of the additional funds necessary to complete the project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $14,383 be appropriated from the general fund FY14 cash capital account provide additional funds for the Northampton High School heating and cooling system freeze protection project. Move to recommend. Move to recommend. Second it. Oh, we got two firsts and a second. Yep. So, Councilor Tacey. <clears throat> the $59,000, I'm assuming that that was uh, a cost estimate that was probably within. We have the answer man here, the mayor. The cost, the 59, it was a cost estimate that we had that's generated correct. from within. That's that's correct. Okay. And how many bids did we get? Was there more than one? Or? Uh, I can't give you the exact, oh, okay. but um, I would assume for, uh, I can't give you the exact number, okay. but I can certainly research that. For I was under the impression that we had based this number on what, what had happened previous years, but I, I think, could be wrong. I think one of the issues was, um, I think, as it says in the memo that I provided, one of the, the hang-ups was the, the um, disposal. unanticipated disposal costs, the hazardous fee disposal yeah. costs for disposing of the old material. Yeah. I think that's where the estimate came in short. Okay. So um, I don't know whether that was internal, external, um, but Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious. That's all. And yeah. the $14,000 out of the general fund is from the city, and the other, which is not listed in here, is from the school. It's going to be yeah. part of their school maintenance. They're going to absorb it in their maintenance budget. Thank you. They just we they were unable to absorb a, the full twenty-eight thousand in their maintenance budget. So we agreed to fund half of it out of cash capital, and they would fund the rest. Mm -hmm. Thank so. you, Councillor uh, Labarge. Thank you, um, Mayor. On this price, I I really do have concerns, like Councillor Tacy does. In other words, this did not go out to bid. This was just a price that was put in place, correct, before you got the actual estimate. Uh, we, no, no, no. Typically when we, um, when we put together any kind of a capital program, we're using, uh, we're using fun, we're, we're trying to get <laughs> our best estimates from contractors to get an understanding of what a project will cost. Um, but we don't actually go out to bid if we don't have the f if we don't have funding authorization to actually you know go go out for a project. So in this case, we were using uh, you know our our best estimates, probably talking with contractors, trying to get a sense of what it would cost, um, and and so that's the number we used when when they came before the capital improvement committee. That's the number that they put together. Um, but you know when the capital when Departments go before the Capital Improvement Committee. They don't put together a full bid and go out to bid to find out what the pricing is. So you. sometimes you have a case like this where things come in higher. Sometimes they come in lower. Um, this is just a case where it came in higher. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Tacey. I just want to say thank you for the memorandum, too. It's pretty descriptive. Yes. And, and I just in. wanted to also just call your attention to the last line of the mem uh, memorandum, which was, mm -hmm. if, if at all possible, to get two readings on this. <coughs> so, we want to get the contractor going on this as the weather is starting to get cooler. So, thank you. Yep. 
Good. So any more discussion on this one? Okay, all in favor of aye. a positive aye. recommendation? Aye. 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 aye, aye, Great. Thank you. Um, as there's nothing else on the agenda, I've got to give Mary back her. One of them. Um, uh, so call, uh, call to adjourn the finance committee. We'll adjourn. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Adjourn. Thank you. All right, we're back into the uh, regular session of the council meeting. Um, and then we'll vote on these financial orders. Uh, the first financial order, of course, is the appropriation of $26,200 from the general fund from the FY 2014 cash capital account toward surveying and legal costs associated with private ways. This is the second reading. Move to approve. Second. Is there any discussion on this? Uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 Nay. Yes. 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 Uh, next up in first reading, but uh, you heard the request, is for, for two readings of financial orders appropriation of $14,383 from the general fund FY 2014 capital plan to provide additional funds for Northampton High School heating system, <coughs> cooling system, freeze protection project. Move to approve. Second. Any further discussion on this? Actually, one further question. Uh, Council Adams. Mayor, just the, the school department was just unable to figure it out. Uh, well, they earmarked half, I understand, but they're unable to pay for the other half? Uh, yeah, we, we um, the finance director met with the business manager, and um, and in terms of their, um, their just ongoing maintenance budget, uh, they just didn't believe that they could fund this. And so, uh, you know, I, one solution would be to have them fund it, but then we'd probably, I'd probably be standing before you later in the year asking to transfer money from free cash into their budget to cover maintenance so they've they're running a pretty tight maintenance budget so um so we just felt because this was a pre-existing capital project that was part of the capital plan that we would come back to the council for some of the funding from cash capital so thank you yeah any other discussion or questions yeah. roll call please yes yes Yes. Aye. Yes. 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 Suspend rules. Suspend rule Second. 14. Uh, the motion to suspend rules, uh, rule 14. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Second. Opposed? Okay. Second. Second. Aye. <laughs> let's let's help Mary out. Who who? Uh, <laughs> motion by <laughs> Council Murphy. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, uh, any discussion in second reading? Roll call, please. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Freeman-Danny? Aye. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Uh, we have no orders and ordinances. Uh, we're up to the updates from... Uh, com we got some oh, referrals. Mr. Mr. President. We do have referrals. I take it back. Yes. Late, late files. Yeah. Some late files. Yes. Yep. I move the, that we suspend the late file rule. There's a motion to suspend. Second. Rule 38. <laughs> okay. Rule 38. And there's a second. Any discussion? All those in favor of suspending the rules, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, the, the, uh, I will accept a referral. Move to refer to Seconded. ordinance. Okay. It was, it was moved in second before it was even moved. That's so, right. So you've got we moved we were, second. on a roll. We're on a roll. Uh, any discussion on referral to ordinance? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Oh, aye. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's referral. We can do okay. that. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> it's referral. I'm saying. All right. Now back to the order at hand. Um, the updates from the city council president, that would be me. Uh, we, uh, in conference with the uh, the conference committee from the for the Board of Public Works, we, in, as everyone or most people know at this point, stormwater uh, the stormwater and flood control uh, enterprise fund discussion and ordinance uh, is much on people's minds for obvious reasons, and um, we've decided that. Uh, in, in an aggressive campaign for education and inclusion and transparency that we would like the counselors to consider, the ward counselors to consider, 
establishing uh, a forum in every one of their wards to discuss this further. In the process, I've had discussions with Al Williams from NCTV about producing uh, an information film that would include parts of the presentation that have been made by the Board of Public Works describing the infrastructure and describing the pressures, but at the same time, a, a, a video tour by Jim Dostal, uh, the, the oracle, the community's oracle on all things water, that all the water that passes through this town, um, to be used as also as an educational tool, with the objective being to expand and increase the community understanding and access to this issue and also for their to solicit further their input as we deliberate and try and come up with an ordinance that would would or would not establish an enterprise fund and a fee. Uh, Councilor Barge? Yes. When are you expecting counselors to have these forms in the school? We we would we kind of set a deadline of sorts of six weeks. Within within six weeks, if you can, that would get the hope is, and and if you need more time, we can consider that. I, it's we as I said the last meeting, the intent here is not to rush anything, but at the same time, it's not to stultify it, and because this is a critical issue, we have no deadline. There, I mean, there have been pressures, and there are certainly some people would disagree that we don't have a deadline. But I, from my perspective. The significance of this legislation is trumps everything else. And we're going to cross every T and dot every I and hear from every person who has something to say about this and p use that as part of the consideration um, because of the significance of this. So, but six weeks, hopefully set up a time frame in which counselors can get together, figure out a public space that they can conduct this. Hopefully it will give enough time to process and develop this video that might be available for these presentations. And then to get the word out to their, the, the residents and citizens in their wards who might be interested in participating. Councilor. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to, when you said hopefully get the video, I mean, in other words, we would be calling these meetings relying on external either talking heads or a video or so, I mean. Right. It, and there will be resources. Who would be, who's, who are the people who are available to attend the meetings? Uh, well, Councilor Spector, if you want to speak to that, I was just going to say that we sure, have, right. um, we were going to ask uh, DPW members and engineers and also members of the ad hoc stormwater. Uh, so we need to, we need to, court in terms of like the, the order, I mean, it would, I, I feel like we need to, each counselor, if assuming you're going to spread the <coughs> responsibility among different members of your task force, has to have s some liaison that they're working with, just even on the scheduling front. Like before you even put out a date, yeah. it needs to be coordinated. Right. So I need, I feel like I need an assigned person. Council. Actually, the first thing, the first step would be find a date. There, and it could even be, we talked about this, there may be a couple of them on the same night and that would be okay. But the first thing would be to find a date because then we can. So we find a date independent of the person that, uh, that we're working yes, with too. Because we can then, we have there are enough people that could come from various, to, so that we make sure there's somebody from the DPW, somebody else there perhaps from the, the stormwater task force, the film being ready, that we could, we could do this even if we have a couple of overlaps in the same night. So the, and, and the find, when you say find, the, when you say within six weeks, in terms of the, with, in terms of the timeline for the video, is there a timeline for that? Because it seems like there is not. Probably we wouldn't have a meeting. There, before there it. is not yet, and I and, and I don't want this all the rest on the video. The video is just a, an it, idea. An idea, and, and it will okay. be available for people to see online okay. as well. But the 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 principal part being try and find a date and a location f for a meeting that works for you and works for your constituents, and we'll try and. I mean, the, the objective of six weeks is you don't have to necessarily have the meeting within six weeks. We, we just need to know it would help if we could move this along within six weeks while it's still on people's mind. I think that's of critical importance. Council Carr. Well, uh, it's good to know that we could probably team up, you know, if it made sense to do that in some I agree. instances, but also um, really put it out there that for residents who can't attend a uh, informational meeting in Ward 7, they could come to the informational right. meeting in Ward 1. They right. could, I mean, so I assume generally we're talking about six or seven meetings in the next six weeks 
for well, or what, four or to longer. seven meetings yeah. or longer and that doesn't include the public hearings that will be conducted within committee so that would also you know it'd be ordinance committee which would be a public hearing and uh it, the public hearing the public meeting at youth commission has not occurred yet that would uh, that's scheduled soon um so there's and then uh um and i think it was also referred to edlu Right, so it should be at locations that have what kind of technical requirements, a PowerPoint or a video, or so. I, I'd can. rather keep it, you know, low tech if possible. And if you know, if we have the video and you can show it on a, a, a laptop or something like that, if the video is available. Otherwise, just telling people that there it would be available to be seen on CTV through their the website. And Councillor Freeman Daniels. Um, I understand the motivation here. But I disagree that uh, each counselor should be charged with uh, the provision of a forum. Uh, I know my ward, Ward 3, just to plug it, uh, is, has a very active neighborhood association. If you ask us for a, for a forum, uh, we can get it together in like, you know, 10 days. But uh, I think that it is, um, uh, I, th I think that um, the level of verification that this event happened uh, I, I just don't understand it. I mean, are, is, are the committees going to be waiting for the uh, for the fora to be completed before they pass it on to the council? Um, what if the forum happens and the councilor can't make it? Um, I, I think that there are too many. I think there should be a few. There there could be seven, but there should be a few. I, I think there could be fewer than seven officially sponsored fora from the city, from the board, from uh, from the council. From from the the body itself, not from the counselors, three, four, five of them. I think seven is too many. Um, that uh, has a set presentation, mm -hmm. and has time for questions, and those questions and answers are recorded. Uh, I think this is a mistake to leave it to each counselor. And um, I also, like I said, like I just said, I'll repeat it. The method of verification that these happened, that they happened, that the that they were properly conducted, that people got the right information. There's just too many uh, variables for me to want to, uh, to believe that this is a good process. However, that being said, I will do it faithfully, uh, and I know the War Three Association will sponsor one uh, with me and will do an excellent job, I, I, but I do think it's, um, it's a mistake to do this. I, th I think it was a mistake to deviate from the city's process uh, and not to have city council sponsor a set of four. Thank well, you. they're not mutually exclusive. And I think that's an important salient point here. These are not mutually exclusive. There will be city council sponsored uh, fora. The, this is, I mean, principally, this is a fact gathering tour for councilors, the councilors in their respective wards to hear from their constituents. You're not charged with it. We're asking it's a request. It's, it is the, so it's an information, it's, it's as much for a counselor to understand the concerns, the pressures, or the, the, the goals of their constituents. And then there will be, it does not run in conflict with, as I said, the already established hearings that we're going to have here in the community. And it's, it's no, I have no power to mandate or require this to the counselors. I'm, this is a request, and I should have put a question mark at the end, perhaps. But that, that I think that's our hope. The ho and I think the because I think this the strongest feature of this is the education factor um, the, the increasing the awareness of the community of the pressures and then also our responsibilities and what it is that, that, that they will be expected to do and anything that we can do towards that goal is to the good by my right Councilor Spector. so <coughs> Councilor, I was with you um, we we had some discussions about how many and I was a strong proponent of three, that seven seemed too many in the last discussion. Uh, I was swayed tonight when I met with the fellow counselors about this, um, only because I think it's a slightly different, I see the, these meetings as a little more informal. I want to make sure that we have, the reason I think it is important to have some kind of presentation is so that that's the verification of the data. That's why I think it is important to have a video or something so there's consistent data presented as the education piece. So I think that's necessary, whatever that might be. If it's a couple of people who do a PowerPoint, if it's this video, um, if it's somebody who does a presentation, I, I agree with you, that has to be. What I see is that 
these meetings can be more informal to get input. There are a lot of people who, for example, coming to JFK where there are 60 or 70 people and there are all the counselors there, feel a little more hesitant to stand up. And I would like to see a little more input. And so that's why I was swayed by this. I could also be swayed back the other way. But I see this, and of course the council president is right, I don't see this as then taking away from the larger meetings as well, which we're going to have. Councilor Schwartz. Um, I agree with everybody. Uh, no, what I want to say is <laughs> yes, I really do. I sort of feel like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, I, I guess I think there is something intimate um, about and more conducive to conversation when you've got your counselor inviting their ward to a conversation. I am comfortable with putting that out there. I, I really agree with Owen and, and with you because I don't think you would, I think you would actually agree, but strongly believe that it has to be a set presentation. So when you're saying, call, give us the date, tell me, I'll tell you who's free, um, that makes me anxious. I mean, not that I'm having, I, I don't think we should go forward unless there is a template mm -hmm. that is being followed at every single one. It is exactly what Owen was saying. I think that's mm -hmm. an excellent point. And, it, and if we are, if the whole point is to generate discussion, we have to be generating it, or, and generate education, then we have to be generating it on the same facts, as and the same presentation of the facts, or we just make it one big mess. Exactly, I agree. So I feel like that to me is in the, the task force court. Okay. We uh, need well, that uh, cued. Uh, we'll take your charge. Uh, we'll, uh, I'm actually going to defer to the conference committee and let them uh, work with the Board of Public Works and with the ad hoc committee and to develop a template for the presentations so that you have everyone has coinciding uh, materials and, I, and I'd like to add the one thing I didn't add this is as much for us this is our education as well uh, let's not I don't want to pass off any illusions that we're the sole possessors of unique knowledge about this system that others don't have we need to understand this as well because, it, in fact, more importantly than most, we need to understand this because we have to deliberate it and establish it and vote it. So I think this also serves that purpose for us to receive our own education as, <coughs> as we work through this. Some of us certainly have, uh, uh, counselors, uh, Tacey Adams, inspector, certainly have been immersed in this forever. And uh, they're far more fluent at this than, than all the rest of us, perhaps. And so to that end, I, I don't, the more, most important thing is I don't want the counselors to have any doubt. Now, there may be citizens who will ultimately have doubt. I mean, there will always be someone who will feel that there has not been enough deliberation or consideration or thoughtfulness. But I want us to feel confident that when we go in and vote and we start to debate this, that we're debating it with, with the understanding of, of all the circumstances. So to that end, that's why I hope that we do this. So. How's this? <laughs> Councilor Adam Spector and Tacey are now charged with trying to uh, um, craft a template or to get the people available and the people who could help speak and make these presentations. And I will work with uh, NCTV in trying to develop this video in a timely fashion and make it watchable, <laughs> which, be, you know, has its, I mean, that's part of it. And then, and then we'll proceed from there. Is that? Uh, Councillor Tacey first, and then Councillor Labarge. Yeah, I don't want anybody to think that any nothing about the stormwater fee has been etched in stone yet. I mean, nothing. I mean, first it was going to be a set $123, and then we heard from the public that that wasn't a good idea. It's a tiered system, and even the task force claims no no uh, ownership of the budget. Maybe the budget won't be this. Maybe the budget might not be $2 million. Who knows? Everything is, is going to be subject to change here, and there is nothing etched in stone. And this is all going to be educational for us. I am sure that after we have a single meeting, we're going to come out of there, we're going to change something else. So in six weeks, I don't want anybody to think that's a drop-dead date either. And that's not. It's really right. not. We don't, it is not, uh, there are no drop-dead dates. There are some pressures on the mayor, but unfortunately the mayor, you know, that's, that's his pay grade, and he's going to have to suffer our deliberations. Uh, Council Labarge. Yes. My main concern is who is going to actually run that meeting? Is well, it going to be the Board of Public Works? Or no, I would prefer it's no longer 
This is no longer in the realm of the Board of Public Works. They have made their recommendations. This is up to us in our vote, and I hope that uh, when you have a meeting that, that the respective counselors for the wards manage their meeting. So I'm not going to get up there and talk about this storm. I, I don't think he means present. He you don't present. have to present. You just really have to preside over the meeting. Well, I, I can certainly make myself available. Councilor Adams, both, we're both at large, and we would be glad to participate as well. I think okay. the it should be understood as the invitation of the counselor, uh, of the ward counselor. They don't. You don't have to make the comprehensive presentation. You can simply say this is a forum where we're inviting input from the community. Right. So, um, and and it's an educational forum. It's well, an educational it is, tour. But I'm not going to be talking about that because nothing has been decided, and I'm not an engineer. Right. No. No. We'll. That, that's what we're talking about is trying to make available engineers from the uh, uh, Department of Public Works uh, and also members of the ad hoc stormwater uh, committee to be available to describe the structure of the funding and things like that and my question is will the Board of Public Works be there since they've done several of the presentations we, we, that is our hope that someone from the Board of Public Works because they have their engineers right right that's that is our hope yes Thank you. Okay. Um, thank God I'm not limited to one minute announcements because, um, damn it, I was going to get this out by eight. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. The uh, Transportation Parking Commission has openings on two committees public transit for people who are interested in talking about buses and, uh, and other methods of uh, public transportation. <coughs> Train as well, yes, public transit and also parking committee. We've had another resignation, so we're parking committees on bare bones. They've got a lot of things to chew on, a lot of important policy stuff. So if you're interested in serving on the parking committee, get in touch with me or Councilor Tacey. Any other, uh, Councilor Murphy? Uh, just a quick one. Uh, Councilor Barge, are you uh, judging the costumes in Florence again this year for the grade? I, I don't know. I've got so much going on on my plate. I don't know. Well, Florence will be having its Halloween parade again. It's a wonderful time for parents and children. Councillor Labarge and uh, our city clerk have been the judges for years and years, and hopefully Councillor Labarge will <coughs> squeeze that into his schedule again. Uh, Councillor Tacey's often there. I'm often there. So yes. please put that on your schedule to go up to Florence Center and join in the Halloween parade. It is huge fun. Oh, it's great. Huge fun. The date, then, on October 30th? It's on Halloween. On Halloween night. Halloween night starts at Trinity Row Park and goes up to the uh, Civic and Business Building where they have a party and judging and popcorn. and popcorn. I think you probably can count on Councilor LaBarge squeezing it into her schedule. And then after that you run down the street and they get to my house and all of those kids that have been there, you get 224 kids. We count them every year. Last year, come to the door. 407 Massasoit Street. It's uh, fun. It starts. It, it's okay. actually early. It starts early. It really is a ball. Yeah. It is. Five o'clock. Yep. Okay. And there's usually. Uh, is there going to be cider and donuts? Oh, well, there's all kinds of all kinds That's of fun. Move adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, first pitch. Um, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Oh, did uh, did you have? A he already moved. It. Oh, you had already moved it. I'm sorry. Well. All those in favor of adjourning. Aye. 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 I thought you were Thank you all.